I just want to introduce our next speaker. So uh, Shabir Akhtar is probably one of the few scholars who is um, well placed to talk about human nature from both a philosophical and religious viewpoint. He's worked in the field of race relations and has a doctor of, uh, doctorate in philosophy of religion. Um, he's also taught um, internationally in Malaysia and the US. I fear that um, I may be guilty of a theological error of exaggerating the differences between uh, the, the portrait of human nature that Professor Raymond Tullis would approve of because I think that uh, humanity is in many ways, in modern ways, distinct from the animal world. So I will be arguing for that view, perhaps in conscious awareness of Professor Raymond Tullis' views. But let me just begin by saying that um, the reason I'm interested in the question of human nature in the context of the modern world is that um, I was very distressed by a line of, um, the, of uh, George Orwell, whom you might think of as a as a prophet with honor in his native land. He was a man to whom people listened. And he's credited with the comment that every life is a failure from the inside. I don't agree with that view, but I think it's a very interesting and provocative and insightful comment. Perhaps in some ways a kind of an epitaph on the 20th, 20th century and on the despair which I think secular humanism has brought upon the world and to which I think a useful antidote would be a more religious anthropology. But I'll argue for that view rather than merely assert it. You're all familiar, of course, with the uh, much more mundane claim that all political careers are a failure. That I think I have more sympathy with. But the idea, <laughs> but the idea that all human life is a failure from the inside, I suspect what Orwell was thinking of is that perhaps when we all secretly examine our lives, um, if we, let's say, um, compile a kind of informal resume or CV of all our failures, the things that we don't want employers to look at, you know, things we tried for but we didn't get, perhaps. I suspect that's what he had in mind. But if his comment is more about the fact that, in some sense, human nature is radically lacking the resources to be successful and to be able to cope with the demands of our history as we have now reached this particular stage in history, then I think that's a very disappointing and desolating comment upon human nature. Uh, and perhaps Orwell had human beings in a secular capacity, meaning in, in the secular humanist sense rather than uh, in any religious sense. I suspect by this stage of his life, Orwell probably had no sympathy with any religious um, outlook, including that of his own uh, Christian background. So before I talk a bit about the concept of human nature, I think it's worth saying in our current cultural context that while someone like Muhammad, who brings this book called the Quran, which is the foundation of Islam, is considered by his uh, disciples and followers as a perfect man, somebody worth imitating, if not in his prophetic role, obviously, he's the last prophet, but in his prophetic consciousness of the world, meaning a certain way of living uh, gratefully, penitently in the world, grateful to God, that is. Um, it's very interesting that of all the world's major founders of faith, he's the most maligned, the most despised. I, thought, I, don't need to, uh, uh, I don't need to argue for that point. I'm sure you're all aware of the amount of satir satirical depiction that goes on. And although that is true, of course, of Christianity too, culturally there's a bit more uh, capital, I think, in, the ten in terms of greater cultural sympathy for, for Jesus Christ than there would be for Muhammad. So I'm interested in asking this question in the context of how this particular man, who brings a book which Muslims regard as arising in an historical vacancy, meaning there's no explanation for the book. Now, of course, what I mean by that is that unlike, say, Isaiah or Jeremiah or Jesus or Paul, Muhammad does not belong to a tradition of recognized author of monotheism. These people came within a context of monotheism, whereas this man arises in a pagan culture and then brings monotheism <laughs> and at the same time uh, challenges two existing monotheisms. So that's why I think it's worth keeping him in mind when I uh, talk about the Muslim portrait of human nature. For as it happens, we only have it because of the fact that we have uh, this particular man who has brought it to us. So I just want to say those preliminary comments before I talk about something more detailed. Something more detailed from the, from the Quran itself. <clears throat> 
By the way, I should add, incidentally, that having given lots of talks of this type, one of the great privileges of being a philosopher is that no one of any importance in society takes you seriously. Um, <laughs> so therefore, I'm not at all nervous or thinking, oh, I wonder what kind of people I hear. If I were an MP for some constituency, I'd be very concerned about what people go away thinking. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the portrait of um, human nature in the Quran, it's actually fairly straightforward. It has great similarities, uh, both with Judaism and perhaps with Hellenic thought, meaning you know, philosophical thought of Plato, for example, but not so much with Christian thought. The idea is, not remarkably really, that there are two impulses inside human beings, the desire to do what is evil and wrong, and then there's a counterforce, which is called the, the soul that self-accuses. You might call that the equivalent of conscience, and you get that same faculty in the Gentiles, for example, according to Rome, Romans, the, the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans early in chapter 1. He mentioned there's a faculty that we all possess which convicts people who are not Jews but Gentiles because there's enough knowledge about the law of God. So the idea, this idea is in common to the Semitic religions, that there's a self-accusing soul, is the Quranic expression, that there's a self-accusing soul within human beings which warns you when you're doing something immoral. But there's an equally strong force called the soul that orders evil. And this soul is mentioned in the Quranic uh, uh, story of the life of Joseph in the context of the seduction scene, uh, which is also found in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. The idea is that there's a soul that tempts people to be unfaithful to their higher or better nature. Now, what's interesting and different about this portrait of human nature is that this is actually a God-endowed constitution. So there's no blame on the human creature. This is the way we're made. Human beings are made to sin, also made to repent. And that the dual uh, tension between these two forces is what leads ultimately to the successful soul, the soul at rest, which is the soul that enters paradise. And presumably the equivalent of that, though not mentioned in the Quran, is the soul that has destroyed itself because it has permitted the evil side of its nature to triumph over the uh, self-accusing soul. Uh, you get a similar notion in, um, in rabbinic Judaism where there's a yetzer ha tov, the, the impulse towards good, and yetzer ha ra, the impulse towards extreme evil. And there's a battle going on between these. As I said, not very remarkable. You find, you find in, have most of this in Hellenic thought too. Plato has a, a similar tripartite model as well. But what is unusual by it from our point of view is, of course, that this is part of the constitution of human nature as ordained by God which means that it's a very different, perhaps, from the Christian portrait. So the result of this in terms of moving on, if you like, to the issue of sin and salvation and how human beings are conceptualized in the Quranic anthropology is that there is actually no such thing as salvation because we are not being saved from sin. More precisely, we're not being delivered from sin. Sin is simply an empirical reality and God has the ability to forgive it without any complex mechanism. So human beings sin, then they take a shower and do two prayer cycles and they repent, and that's the end of the matter. So it has no ontological reality. It's not something that requires <clears throat> a complex machinery of redemption or atonement, as I'm sure those of you who've read Paul's epistles see the agony and the agonizing theological detail he gives about how this machinery is operated. Now, I'm not saying, of course, this is untrue. I'm saying it's a, simply a more complex uh, view of th looking at things. And part of the reason for that is that there is such a thing as anthropology, uh, a Quranic anthropology, which I've just outlined, but there's actually no such thing as Quranic theology, because the Quran has no interest in theology. It comes as a bit of a shock to Christian audiences, uh, possibly some Jewish audiences too, because you're so inured to the idea of studying God. But it's presumptuous, I think. Um, how can we study God? All we know of God, presumably, is what he reveals of his will to us. Now, Christians would say, yes, but there's a bit more than that because we have the image, the, the moral perfection of the life of God himself as lived out in Christ in the incarnation. And it's a perfectly valid and uh, consistent alternative view. But I'm saying that we can't uncritically use words like theology in a religion that is actually more interested in the revelation of God's will and the legal consequences of that, how to live your life in a certain way. So not to be polemical, but just to point out that uh, the categories, if you like, of uh, <clears throat> thinking that Muslims have are radically different from that. Any comments by the or questions so far? Am I going too fast or does it make sense about human nature in the Quran? Is it perfectly fine? Yeah? No. Okay, good. All right. I'm giving these comparative comments uh, because I want you to be able to relate it. You know, I assume that most of the audience's background is 
Christian or secular, humanist or agnostic in some way, and possibly Jewish. Um, and I don't see many people of an Islamic background, so I just want to make sure that I can uh, carry you with me in that regard. Just one more comment about the theological issue, because I keep on saying that there's no such thing as theology. You might say, what about this notion about man, here used generically to include women, that man is made in the image of God. Uh, well, it's a Hebraic idea, and it's carried over in Christianity, uh, and it is carried over in Islam in some sense too. It has very, very important ideological consequences because it implies that secular, the secular humanist view of human nature is fundamentally wrong because we all have a innate uh, or inborn or congenital knowledge of God. And that's a view that seems ideological because people say, well, what's the evidence for that? What's the evidence for saying that human beings are all endowed with the knowledge of God from birth? And there are complex arguments for that which I'll survey briefly. But the idea that some part of God himself is infused or breathed into the human creature is a Quranic one, as well as being uh, similar to the Jewish one. Not quite the same as the image of God. That's a complex notion, in fact, because I'm not sure what, what the word image means here. I mean, the image of, a, in, in the case of a secular reality, like a lamp, for example, casting an image, the image has a reality of its own as well as a parasitic reality, meaning if you remove the object of which it is an image, then the image is no longer there. I don't think that's quite true with human nature because it's evident that human nature, as we know from the musings of existentialists and secular humanists, seems to have some independent existence. So it's, not, it's entirely possible to understand human nature, it seems, without reference to God. At least on the surface, that seems to be the case. Maybe at a deep level, conceptual analysis apart, maybe it's not. So I don't want to beg the question, as we philosophers say, meaning assume the truth of something I'm trying to prove. I think it's entirely possible that one could have a perfectly coherent, uh, conceptually coherent conception of human nature without a reference to God. In other words, the burden of proof is upon believers in one God or more than one God, in this day and age certainly, to show in what sense uh, God informs the human creature. In other words, in what sense is our humanity dependent upon some divine component within the human creature? I don't think it's self-evident. I think it was self-evident uh, in a cultural sense in ages past. Certainly um, in the Christian West up till maybe 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and in the Islamic world even today. It's um, unthinkable for someone to think that human nature doesn't have that divine component. But since we are talking the context of Western secular modernism, which in a sense is the ubiquitous condition of mankind. I mean, you go west wherever you go, right? There's no such thing as the east, incidentally. And that's even true on an aeroplane, because wherever you go, you can speak English, people will understand you. So both culturally and theologically, or if you'd like, in a Christian sense, messianically, if the messianic message of Paul is global in a way, it's everywhere. Wherever you go, there's a certain vocabulary, the modern vocabulary of talking. In fact, to up to the extent that some someone might even say, if he was being disparaging, that um, secular humanism is the latest denomination of Protestantism. <laughs> it's obvious from my stance that Obviously, I do not think that um, you know, man can be reduced to, the, to his animal status. But I do not deny, of course, that um, there are profound similarities. I mean, and for example, some of the things that Professor Raymond Tellus believes and other people who've spoken earlier, Eric Olson, I believe, I didn't attend that, but the notion that we have much in common with the animals in a biological sense uh, is certainly something that I think needs to be taken seriously because if one were to dismiss the findings of the Enlightenment about the origins of our species, that would be unscientific and uh, intellectually arrogant. Nonetheless, I do not ultimately believe in the simian origins of the human race. Uh, I do believe that it was, um, it was an act of creative will by a supreme mind. And I admit that this sort of view is very difficult to prove because nature, natural objects and so on are ambivalent, they can sustain a purely naturalistic explanation of how the world is or how it came about or how it appears to us. You can have an intimate knowledge of nature, be a great poet, for example, or have an aesthetic appreciation and not be a believer. This seems odd because when you look at the scriptures, the heavens declare the glory of God and the Quran has the same view that the signs of God are evident in nature and only those who are, who are perverted in some way deny them. I think in the modern world that doesn't seem to be true. 
we can have perfectly conscientious atheists. It's a bit of a puzzle, I think, theologically, why that's possible, but I don't deny the empirical reality that it is possible. However, I think it's a bad thing, and that's the burden of my talk. I think that uh, there are very good reasons why we, we should not think of secular humanism as the terminus of human society, because it would imply that someone like Richard Dawkins is the supreme apex of human creation. <laughs> and I believe that Richard Dawkins' motto is that there is no God, but I'm his prophet. Um, in terms of argument, um, the staple argument in all scripture in the Semitic religions is the idea of a teleological presence of God in nature, that God is the supreme designer, he created the world. In David Hume, um, there's a very able refutation of this opinion, and David Hume is the first philosopher in the Western tradition who basically signed a death warrant uh, for, for theology, in fact, for natural theology. Um, and he's the first great philosopher in the Western tradition in whom um, you see a bifurcation between theology and philosophy, uh, meaning he's entirely on the side of philosophy, perhaps understood in a pagan sense, rather than... Many of the great philosophers, as you know, were actually Christians in the Western tradition. In fact, some of them were saints, like St. Anselm, St. Aquinas, um, St. Thomas Aquinas, Anselm, and St. Augustine. The three great saints of the medieval millennium from the 4th to the uh, 14th century were, in fact, all uh, devout uh, Christians. They were saints. So that liaison has been broken. Uh, the other great culprit in this, of course, is Descartes. Um, the idea that it's quite possible to have perfect knowledge of the natural world without having any moral virtue as the person who knows that world is a Cartesian one. And it is in fact not found uh, either in, uh, in, in Platonic Greek thought or in the, in the out, outlook of the Quran or indeed in the Bible. You, I'm sure you've heard of these sayings that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And in the Quran as well, after every biography of every prophet, it says, and once they had reached their maturity, we gave them wisdom and knowledge. So the idea is that knowledge, secular knowledge included, that of nature, is actually a reward for virtue, for something moral. We no longer believe that. I'm sure you all know great scientists and great philosophers and great intellectuals in the universities who are perfectly moral human beings. So it, it came to me as a bit of a shock when I was a student at Cambridge when I found that some of my professors of moral philosophy led very immoral lives. Um, and it, in fact, later on it occurred to me that this in fact was entirely to be expected since they did not have any higher view of the human person's vocation. Uh, so therefore, in some sense, it was to be expected that human beings should not rise to any great moral heights. As I say, the argument from teleology is, philosophically speaking, not sound in my view. Nonetheless, it is psychologically very compelling, meaning intuitively, I think we all tend to think, this seems to be part of the, the make of the, of the human mind, that we look for explanations and we tend to assume the priority of, um, of uh, the mind to matter. So when we see a car moving at a great distance, we do not assume this autonomously moving. Why do we assume there's somebody in it? For what, of course, it could be, on the, based on the evidence, be moving autonomously, meaning without the operation of a mind, so matter itself could be in, in, in self-directed, but we don't make that assumption. And often we have inductively good reasons why we do not make that assumption. We find that our own experience confirms that a moving object is often being put into motion or is being operated by a mind. Um, nonetheless, in terms of it's uh, what we philosophers call logical validity or cogency. There are clear reasons which are primarily given in Hume's uh, dialogues concerning natural religion. Um, and I won't need to rehearse those, but just to say that the kind of age in which we live in, some of the metaphysical assumptions that made natural theology possible and plausible in the past are no longer considered valid. So we now have reached a stage in human history where I think uh, we actually do need to argue for the truth of certain biblical or scriptural claims or Quranic claims. Uh, I think the burden of proof is upon uh, the, those who are considered apologists for, that, for their particular faith. The moral argument for the existence of God is in my view a very fundamental one and it will lead me to talk about the question of why I think secular humanism, even if it's intellectually plausible, is morally and humanly a disaster for the human race. Um, the moral argument is that when we look at a work of scripture, 
uh, you know, whether it's the Quran, which is a very homogeneous and short scripture, by the way, compared to the Bible, and also it has the distinction of being reliably associated with somebody in known history. I mean, with other founders of faiths, it's mostly legend, I think. Uh, Paul, I think, is the first person to grow up in the full light of history. Other founders of faiths, the Buddha certainly we're not sure about. Muhammad in, indisputably grew up in real history because there are Byzantine records contemporary with him. So we know that he was a real person and what he brought was a book that can be reliably associated with him. Now the question is when such a book comes which essentially critiques two existing monotheisms and also critiques the pagan uh, Arabs of the day, on what basis should one believe such a work? I mean nowadays if somebody in a sheet and sandals said to you that he had heard from God, I think your reaction would be that he was suffering from dementia or that he had some kind of mental illness. No one would take him seriously. Is that a fair assumption? So how is it that anybody at any stage in history was able to get away with making such claims? Now, of course, it didn't happen overnight, but I think it's something to do with our assessment of the moral credentials, both of a person and of the message, but of the person as well. By the way, am I fine for time? Um, yeah, go by another order, 20 minutes. Yeah, thanks. So, in terms of deductive mathematical truths, we try and prove 2 plus 2 equals 4, quadrat demonstrandum, we use a certain method. How do we know if someone makes a claim of a metaphysical kind, and it doesn't have to be supernatural, even if somebody makes a claim such as, I'm your friend, why should one believe that? I love you, for example, to use a human relationships. How do we assess these claims, their validity, their, their veracity? Um, clearly not a mathematical method is used. We don't use the mathematical method that the logical empiricists want to impose upon all types of knowledge. Obviously there's knowledge other than scientific and mathematical where we do not use that method. We use some other method for aesthetic judgments, moral judgments, personal judgments. And I think that that model is the perfect virtue of the human personality. I think that if we find a person with perfect virtue, it's a model that Christians will be sympathetic with too then what that person says is prima facie got a certain claim to being true. I think we use that method with people as well when we're dealing with other human beings, whether to trust them or not. We do assess what else is trustworthy and reliable about them in general before we look at the particular claim they're making which we are assessing. So the Islamic method would be that if Muhammad lived a life of perfect obedience to God and virtue, then the things he brought, even if some of which were counterintuitive to the pagan Arabs of the time, then it must be true. Now, I agree that there are incommensurable models here because, of course, that could be used of another person, like, say, the Buddha, who comes with an equal amount of virtue in his life, and therefore the system associated with him called Buddhism is equally true. And it's not really my, uh, it's not really my argument that Islam is uniquely true in this regard, only that it is likely to be partly true, and that if it is partly true, then other related rival religions are also partly true. I mean, it's a more modest claim uh, rather than simply saying that, you know, one particular religion has absolute priority. But I should add that I do not speak here as an imam or the leader of my community. I'm not, we have no clergy in Sunni Islam, which is my religion, Orthodox Islam. Shiite Islam has a clergy where people speak ex cathedra. I, I simply speak as someone with my own opinions on the subject. So the moral argument would be that not only that in assessing the validity of scripture in, inside history we have to look at the virtue of the person bringing it, but also I think something that may be valid, this is Kant's argument, Immanuel Kant, that the, in order to do justice to the moral consciousness that we have as human beings, we need a God. I mean his idea was that we needed freedom of the will, we needed immortality of the soul, and we needed an all-powerful all God. Why did we need an all-powerful God? For one very compelling reason. If there is no God to align um, virtue with happiness and vice with misery, then some people die uh, with the knowledge that they have essentially cheated the moral consciousness. So many people who are tyrants and evildoers will die and will not be brought to justice or to account. Does that thought by the trouble you sometimes when you look at some of these politicians glibly talking on TV, justify themselves in front of home, human audiences, you think they've had plenty of practices in this world. I hope they'll do just as well on the Day of Judgment where they're standing in front of God justifying some of their actions. Does it trouble you morally that some people will, in fact, get away with it? Does that trouble anyone here? Or do you think that's, there's just blind justice? Why should one be troubled by a thought like that? Because I find that myself a, a disturbing thought that... Uh, people can actually get away with. I don't mean minor moral errors, by the way. I think we're all guilty of that, but I mean major ones. Does anyone find that a troubling thought? <laughs>
when you sleep at night, the idea that spectacular, conspicuous evil will actually go scot-free. And that some conspicuous virtue that, like that of a saint will actually not be rewarded. Does that trouble anyone as a thought? It does? Yeah. So I suppose for me that would be actually the basis of a moral argument for God. Now, obviously as an argument, in you know, logical terms, a very poor argument because it simply means that we have a moral and a psychological compulsion to want such a God. It doesn't mean that there is one. Uh, but nonetheless, it seems to me that's probably the best we can do. And it's not saying much because the state of um, uh, current natural theology and apologetics is quite abysmal, I think. Uh, I think there's very few new arguments being brought forward which can uh, promulgate that particular classical theology. The best you can do now is to shield religious belief against the charge of irrationality. At one time, natural theology was trying to claim that atheists are irrational. I think that's much more difficult to do now. I think the best we can do now is to say that um, atheists may be wrong on some matters. Not that they're irrational, but they're mistaken. And they're mistaken if you look at the larger picture, which is the last motif I want, I want to say, then I'll stop and, and give you plenty of time to ask me questions. On the question of human flourishing, um, I lived in uh, America for about 10 years, and I, um, I resigned, and I came back to Britain recently. And, um, one of the things I realized, not just America, but you know, advanced capitalism in general and capitalist modernity, if you like, is that it struck me talking to my students, uh, mainly, the, mainly doing doctorates, but some undergraduate students in philosophy, that they did not say this. This is why I think that they thought that they lived in a world in which neither love nor friendship was possible, that no genuine human relationships were possible. And I think that's incredibly tragic. And I wanted to know why. And it occurred to me that a lot of them many of whom had no religious faith, but some who did by they have robust religious faith, Christian faith, seemed to think that we had reached a stage where all human, human relationships were essentially to do with materialism and consumerism. We weren't citizens, we we're consumers. And that any kind of depth in human beings, which includes trust, was not actually possible. So that the wisest person was the one who did not agonize over this, worry about human love and trust, but simply got on with the job of earning enough money and having a degree of comfort. So what we were talking about earlier today, about the human need for reciprocal acknowledgement, you know, the baby who gets traumatized because the mother leaves the room, doesn't feel that he's being affirmed. It seemed to me that we reached tragically a, state in a stage in history where I think people are resigned to that fact. I mean, I don't know how true this is of England now. I left about 12 years ago, uh, but when I talked to some of my students in Oxford as well, I get this undercurrent of a despair at what secular humanism is. Now, this is not necessarily an argument for religious faith, because of course I'm well aware that not all religious faith is, is nourishing. Uh, there's plenty of religious people who are unhappy too. And certainly in the Islamic tradition, there's a lot of legalist piety, um, which may be simply formal and may be performed out of fear of sanctions in certain societies or fear of public disapproval here in Britain. So I'm not making it a direct argument, but it does seem to me that whatever may be the ultimate truth about the world in terms of our flourishing, what we currently have is, is a very bad deal. 